Catherine Mary Knight was convicted for the killing of her boyfriend, John Price, in October 2001. She is the first woman to be sentenced to life imprisonment without parole in Australia. She stabbed, skinned, decapitated, and then cooked John Price with the intention of feeding it to his children for dinner. The following content contains explicit and graphic details. Viewer discretion is advised. Investigation Hour. Born on October 24th, 1955, in Tenterfield, New South Wales, Catherine Mary Knight was the younger of twins to Barbara and Ken Knight. Her mother had already had four sons, Patrick, Martin, Neville, and Barry, from a previous marriage. She had another son, Charlie, with Ken Knight, and would soon birth another boy in 1961, Shane. Catherine grew up with many siblings, but this was no picturesque happy family. She grew up in a very unconventional, chaotic home. Catherine's father, who worked at the local slaughterhouse, was a raging alcoholic and would abuse and rape their mother up to 10 times per day. Barbara, their mother, would confide intimate and sexual details to her young daughters about the abuse she was undergoing. She would tell them how much she hated men and sex, but that she had to put up with it. Although Catherine claims her father never sexually abused her or her siblings, she said she was sexually abused by multiple members in her family, including her brothers, until she was 11 years old. This was confirmed by multiple members in her family to be true. Their parents took turns in beating them with an electrical cord or a dog leash. These aspects of their childhood, which was abnormal to most, became a normal day-to-day for them growing up. In school, classmates would describe Catherine as a bully. She would often get into physical confrontations with students and even a teacher and have fits of violence. By age 15, she would drop out of school, barely knowing how to read or write, and would get a job at a clothing factory. A year later, she got her dream job at the local slaughterhouse. At a mere 16 years of age, she would join her father, twin sister, and brother working there. This was considered a good job in their small town, and it was something Catherine was very proud of. She had a lot to prove and quickly climbed up in rank to earn a promotion as a deboner, and she received her own set of butcher knives to cut and skin the animals with. She was so obsessed with her job and so prideful of it that she would hang her butcher knives over her bed as trophies. She was quoted saying, They would always be handy if I needed them. Coworkers claimed seeing Catherine often walking over to watch the pigs get their throats slit. In 1973, Catherine met her first husband, David Kellett. Things moved fast and they moved in together. Then a year later, marriage followed. Their marriage was far from peaceful. On their wedding night, Catherine attempted to strangle him when he fell asleep after making love three times. She demanded that they had sex five times. This was something her mother had told her growing up, that she had sex with Ken five times on their wedding night. Despite this, Catherine and David would stay together for 10 years before splitting. On their wedding day, Barbara, Catherine's mother, gave some advice to her new husband, David. You better watch this one, or she'll f***ing kill you. Stir her up the wrong way or do the wrong thing, and you're f***ed. Don't ever think of playing up on her. She'll f***ing kill you. 
After breaking up and getting back together multiple times, David had enough. The birth of their first child, Melissa Ann, in 1976, David left Catherine for another woman. Catherine was so distraught by him leaving, she lashed out. She walked down to the train tracks with her baby daughter in her arms and left her in the middle of the tracks to be run over by a passing train. Luckily, a man rescued her from the tracks from hearing her crying. That same day, Catherine had a fit, swinging an axe around, threatening to kill people around her. Police arrested her and she was taken to the hospital and diagnosed with postnatal depression and then released. But really, they released her just like that? Not soon after that, she had another episode where she slashed a woman with a butcher knife and was threatening a child. She was then put into a psychiatric hospital and her husband came to care for her. Surprisingly, after all of this, David got back together with her, and they had their second daughter, Natasha Marie, in 1980. Their rocky relationship abruptly ended in 1984 when Catherine left David with their two daughters. Catherine met her second husband in 1986. His name was David Saunders. He was a 38-year-old local miner. All seemed well in the beginning of their relationship. A few months after meeting, David moves in with Catherine, but keeps his old apartment in Scone. This really upset Catherine, as she felt he wasn't being faithful to her, and she questioned his commitment. She became abusive and erratic with him. They would break up and get back together. In May 1987, they got a puppy together. Catherine wanted to prove to David how serious she was about him and to show him what she was capable of if he ever cheated on her. She took the puppy and slit its throat with a knife in front of David. Then she beat David with a frying pan until he fell unconscious. And still after all of this, David number two stayed with Catherine. In June 1988, Catherine gave birth to their daughter, Sarah. They decided to buy a home together to settle down. Catherine paid the home off and decided she was going to decorate it so nicely. Her inspiration for home decor? Dead animals, of course. Her passion. She filled the walls with taxidermied animals. Horns, skins, skulls, rusty hooks, knives, leather jackets, machetes, and more. The list goes on and no space was left empty, filling all of the walls with creepy decorations. All seemed well. They just bought their first home and had a new baby together. Never a dull moment with Catherine, though. After a fight between the two broke out, Catherine hits David in the face with an iron and stabs him in the stomach with a pair of scissors. This was the final straw for poor David. He left Catherine and went into hiding. Catherine would then file an apprehended violence order against him so he wouldn't be able to visit their daughter or her. In 1990, Catherine met suitor number three, John Chillingworth. Their relationship was more calm than the others. It lasted three years, and they had a baby boy together named Eric. Their relationship would end with Catherine leaving John for another man she had been cheating on him with, John Price, her final relationship. John Price was a father of three children, but his marriage ended and he had been seeing Catherine for some time. He was described as a really well-liked, kind man. Two of his children had lived with him and had really liked Catherine. John was well aware of Catherine's violent history and he still accepted her. Their relationship seemed really good and they were all really happy together. As time passed, Catherine moved into the house with them 
but John was adamant on not getting married, something that Catherine really wanted with him. This triggered Catherine, and in retaliation, she sent images to his boss of stolen items John had taken from work. Granted, the items were medical kits that were thrown away, he was still fired from his job. After working there for 17 years, he was making a really good living, and in their small town, there wasn't much work. He kicked Catherine out of the house and had had enough. Somehow, Catherine really knows how to get these guys to come back to her. John and her got back together, but wouldn't let her move back in. John had told his friends and family of all the abuse he was receiving from Catherine, and many distanced themselves from him. In February 2000, Catherine assaults John and ultimately stabs him in the chest. She of course told police it was in self-defense and filed a restraining order. John told co-workers and his boss that if something happens to him, Catherine is to blame. I'm sure he could feel that something was going to happen. He went to the courthouse to get a restraining order against her. This, of course, didn't stick because Catherine didn't respect the restraining order and would show up to the house anyway. As he gets home, he sees that no one is there. Catherine had sent the kids away on a sleepover. John spends some time with the neighbors and eventually he falls asleep at 11 p.m. Catherine gets home to find him asleep, makes herself dinner, watches some TV, showers, and then wakes John up to have sex, after which he fell back asleep. The next day, John didn't show up for work. His boss and coworkers became worried, given what John had said the night before. If anything happened to him, it was because of Catherine. His coworkers drove to his home and noticed his car was in the driveway. They knocked, but there was no answer. After noticing blood on the front door, they alerted the police. The police break into the home, and blood is everywhere. Blood splatter and smears littered the walls and the floors. There was even a large pool of blood in the hallway. Forensics concluded that Price was stabbed with a butcher knife in the master bedroom while he was asleep. Blood patterns indicated a struggle, and they believe Price woke up and fought back. After which, he stumbled down the hall and made it to the front door, opening it, only to be dragged back into the house where he would later be murdered. Price was stabbed in the front and back of his body 37 times, puncturing vital organs like the liver, stomach, both lungs, aorta, kidney, pancreas, and colon. To stab someone 37 times shows incredible rage toward that person. Many of the stabs occurred after Price's death, indicating Catherine couldn't stop herself from inflicting more wounds. This wasn't just about killing John Price. After she murdered her boyfriend, Catherine showered, got his ATM card, and took out $1,000. Police are still unsure what she needed the $1,000 for, but it shows that she was in control of her actions as she made a 60-minute drive just to get to the ATM. After getting back to the crime scene, Catherine would then do the unthinkable. She very precisely skinned Price's corpse, including his face, ears, and scalp, to where it was all one piece. She then hung it like a trophy on a meat hook in the hallway at the entrance of the home. Her knife work was so precise, the coroner was able to place the skin perfectly back onto his body and sew him up. As police entered the home, they didn't even recognize what the skin curtain was until they found Price's body. His body was discovered in a deliberate fashion with his left arm over an empty bottle and his legs crossed sitting in an armchair. This position she put him in shows the disdain she has for him 
and that she wanted to mock his death. Upon entering the kitchen, even more horror was discovered. Catherine was preparing a family dinner of sorts. After she skinned Price, she decapitated his head and put it into a boiling pot with vegetables on the kitchen stove. She cut off meat from his back and buttocks and cooked it in the oven. She even fed some to the dog while she waited. The pots were still hot and forensics said she got up early to cook and it had been cooking for hours. The table is set and with name cards of Price's two children and handwritten notes next to each place setting. She intended on serving his two children their father's meat for dinner with a side of vegetables. Police go upstairs to find Catherine in bed, sleeping. Bottles of sleeping pills are strewn about next to her. She's unable to wake up. They remove her from the crime scene and she's taken to the hospital where she lies in a coma. After awakening, she claimed to have no recollection of anything that night. Catherine was eventually arrested and would stand trial for the murder of John Price. She would plead not guilty, only to change it later to a guilty plea. Her legal team would argue that she was dissociating and had amnesia, and this was supported by some psychiatrists, also stating that she had borderline personality disorder. Even though she pleaded guilty, she wouldn't accept responsibility for what she did. On November 8th, 2001, Justice O'Keefe sentenced her to life imprisonment with no possibility of parole. The first time in history a woman ever be given this in Australia. In 2006, five years after her sentencing, Catherine would appeal to the life sentence, stating life in prison was too severe for the killing. This appeal was rejected. Thanks for listening. If you're into solved and unsolved crimes and strange mysteries, subscribe to us so you don't miss out on our weekly videos released every Monday at 2 p.m. Pacific time. If you enjoyed this video, give us a like. It would really help us out. Until next time.